official break for coffee because the parents uh, committee who are running the uh, facility just couldn't cope with us all going there at once. So when you go for a cup of coffee, just go out maybe in between the speakers once the speakers have, have finished. Um, the front row seats are reserved for uh, anyone who's got difficulty hearing or visual uh, difficulties. Uh, there's raffle tickets on sale. We've got some excellent prizes. Uh, two prizes have been signed by the uh, First Minister. So uh, we've got some excellent prizes and that will be drawn around about three o'clock uh, this afternoon. Uh, the school is unable to provide any lunch, uh, but there's Weight Row Supermarket around the corner and there's lots of cafes uh, within very short distance of the school. Uh, if you've missed them, the stall set up. There's our own stall there selling merchandise. Nice. There's a book stall, uh, Indie uh, App the stall app there, store Common there. Wheel, Wheel are there selling, selling their books. Their books. I will, I will uh, be referring, referring to, to Robin, Robin uh, McAlpine's Robin book on determination, and they've got some uh, copies on sale at the store. So, um, turning to the first part of the program, uh, we've called this uh, the answers senior voters need. Uh, um, but before we go, I introduce the speakers, let me just give you some background to the planning. We thought of having this conference early in the spring, and this was well before the SNAP general election. So we were planning that at this time we could have been in full mode uh, campaigning for the next independence referendum. Um, we went by, in terms of planning, we're drawing on our own experience of campaigning in 2013-14. And on the streets then, uh, people were raising the issues of currency and uh, older voters, quite rightly, were asking questions um, about pensions and the NHS. And post-2014 surveys confirmed these were important issues for people. Uh, one survey uh, gave the top three reasons why people voted no. The top one, 57% was currency, followed by pensions, followed by the NHS. Um, as Robin McAlpine argues in his book, Determination, he says this, there, there is really an argument to say that pensions played at least as big a part in our failure to win as did currency. And he goes on to state that pensions became a totemic issue for the independence movement's lack of preparedness. So informed by our own individual experiences and also post-2014 surveys and debate, uh, we've posed three questions for this conference. First question, what would pensioners, sorry, what would pensions and social care look like in an independent, progressive Scotland? Secondly, how will new pensions be paid for in an independent Scotland? Because that was the second part of the question. What about pensions and can we afford it? And third question, how do we persuade the majority of 60 plus uh, to, to vote and support a self-determination self uh, for Scotland? So this morning, we're going to look at the first two questions. One about pensions and social care, and also the question of economics. To help us answer those two questions, we've got some of the well-known activists and speakers in the independence movement. Craig DL, Maggie Chapman, George Caravan, and Ian Black. Ian Black has got family commitments. He will be coming uh, later uh, for his, his presentation. 
We've asked the speakers to speak for 20 minutes. Um, after 15 minutes, one of our members will be holding a sign, giving them warning of five. And then when after 20, there'll be a sign going up so they see question and answers. And then after their present, each presentation, you'll be able to answer any immediate questions. And then after all the speakers have presented, we'll have an open panel session. So, um, and that will give us opportunity to debate uh, and ask some of the posing questions. So turning to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Craig DL is Head of Research for Commonweal and over the past year has produced more than a dozen policy papers on currency, on uh, tracking, on central banking and Scotland's finances. And recently he's been looking at options for social security in an independent Scotland. Today he will be presenting for the first time Commonweal's research on the challenges and opportunities for the future of state pension in Scotland. Please welcome Craig Dial. Hi folks, and uh, glad you're all here. Welcome. Um, as just said there, we're, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the state of the state pension in Scotland now and in the, the, the future. We're going to look at the challenges that are facing the, the, the future of the state pension, um, because we are going through some, some pretty significant changes uh, as a country and as economy, as a, a, and an economy. And I'm going to try and offer some solutions that we, we may have to look towards to try and address these challenges. This is, part, is going to be part of a, a, an upcoming paper from Commonweal, um, led by um, Megan Stamper and myself. We've been, we've been delving into some of the numbers around pensions. And as we just said there, I'm going to present some of the findings for the first time here. So for a very brief history, of the concept of a state pension. Ah, formatting's went a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, through the late part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, uh, European governments, including the UK, started to get this idea that the government had a duty of care towards its citizens to make sure that they weren't left in poverty. And part of this were uh, came out the idea of, the, of a pension initially for civil servants and soldiers, then expanding to elderly people who were in poverty. Then after the Second World War, with the publication of the, the famous Beveridge Report, which completely overhauled thinking on NHS, welfare, social security and a, a universal state pension, this started to become the, the, the norm in the UK. Pensions are now one of the largest lines of expenditure on Scotland's um, national finances in the GERS report. The only two lines that are, that, that are larger uh, are education and healthcare. Um, so this year, there was £7.75 billion pounds spent on Scottish state pensions. And this is a sum that's been increasing year on year by about two, two to three hundred million pounds a year. And that video has not worked, so. <laughs> As with many developed countries, Scotland's population is ageing. We're moving from a, a, a society where we had large families with lots of children and people died young to a society where people are living longer and having fewer kids. So, um, and we're now at the point where the, the baby boom of the 1940s after the World War II, those baby boomers, probably may, quite a few in the audience, <laughs> uh, are now starting to retire. And we're going to have another uh, boom from the 1960s starting to retire over the next couple of decades. 
So these are two of the big challenges that are going to come into the, the affordability of the, of the state pension. Also, at the same time, we're getting policies from the UK government on austerity. The changes to the state pension that are affecting, I'm sure many folk here will be in the, the, the WASPy category, the, the, the women who saw their, their pension age increased, um, sometimes with very little warning. Uh, my mother's up the back, she's one of them. <laughs> Um, and, and this is having some fairly profound impacts as well. This is where we get into a bit of maths on a Saturday morning, I'm afraid. <laughs> so there's an, an important concept when you're talking about the affordability of a state pension, and that is the dependency ratio. This is the number of pensioners you have in a society per thousand workers. Right now, we have about 310 pensioners for every thousand people in, in, in the workforce. This number is expected to rise quite sharply. By about 2040, it's going to be about 400 pensioners per thousand working people. So you can already see that if you're using the income taxes and the national insurance from the people in work to pay for pensions, that's going to become a lot harder. So, um, what does that mean in number terms? Between inflation and the number of pensioners, you know, the extra number of pensioners coming into the system, we're seeing pension expenditure rise by about 5% a year. From about 7.7 .7 billion now, by about 2040, it's going to cost about £20 billion a year in your pensions. Of course, inflation affects that number, so in real terms, it's a bit lower. You can look at it in percentage terms. The pension line, which is already the, the third largest in the in the budget is going to increase from 11% of total expenditure to 14%. So what do we do? How do we afford this? How, what, what, what can we do to keep, uh, keep pensioners secure? Well, we can think of a few ideas. This is the one that's favoured by the UK government at the moment. We can just raise the pension age. That way, that someone who was retiring is now still a worker, and that shifts your dependency ratio. We can see that over the next few years, the, the pension age is going to increase. Um, a little bit of news for the UK government. If they're wanting to use this solution to keep the, the, the affordability of the pensions, if they want to keep the dependency ratio at that 310 that it is today, they're not going fast enough. In order to keep the dependency ratio at... Um, about 310, you would need to raise the, in, raise the retirement age by one year every three to four years. Yeah. So by 2040, the retirement age would be 71. That's not going to be a good solution, I'm going to guess. You're already starting to see folk in, um, for example, in, in, in care homes who um, are frankly, older than the people that they're caring for. That's quite an unusual concept to get your head around sometimes. And there's something missing from, yeah, while life expectancy is increasing, got to remember that healthy life expectancy, the age that you can expect to live to in good health, is a lot lower than your total life expectancy. Right now in Scotland, healthy life expectancy is already lower than the retirement age. Actually, thanks to austerity, it looks as if that number started to peak. Imagine that in a developed country in the 21st century, healthy life expectancy has peaked. That's, that's an appalling indictment of the UK government. And of course, if we've got this, big, this increasing gap between healthy life expectancy and actual life expectancy, then healthcare costs start to mount up as well. And how do we pay for them on top of the pensions? So another solution, find more workers. The black line there is the expected number of workers that are going to be in the, the, the Scottish economy over the next couple of decades. And you can again, you can see it's sort of peaking around the late 2020s because you know, families are getting smaller. Um, if we wanted to maintain that dependency ratio at current levels, we're going to need about an extra million workers by 2040. This translates 
to about an extra 60 to 90,000 extra workers in the Scottish uh, economy every year for the next several decades. This is above and beyond current levels of net immigration. Net immigration to Scotland is about 30,000 a year. So we have that 30,000. We need another potentially 90,000 on top of that. This is obviously completely at odds with the UK's policy of getting UK immigration down below the tens of thousands. If they're wanting to seriously address the pension problem, then Scotland could use that allocation itself and you know, barely meet that target. Obviously, Scotland needs its own immigration powers if it wants to be able to deal with this. Whether we can get them as still as part of the UK, it's quite funny. You get these uh, right-wingers down south telling us that the UK needs an Australian-style points-based immigration system. What they don't tell you is that Australia devolves the immigration point allocations to its states. Yet they tell us, David Mundell tells us, that Scotland is not capable of running its own immigration system. Bit of cognitive dissonance there, I would hazard. Another solution, raise taxes. This is always the popular one. <laughs> Pension expenditure is increasing by about 5% a year. National, in nas uh, national insurance and income tax revenue is only increasing by about 3% a year. And most of that's inflation-based. You know, we're not, um, because again, number of workers is, is slowly declining. The, the gap that we expect to see um, in the, in the pension affordability by 2040 would be the equivalent of about eight billion pounds today, so corrected for inflation. I'm going to suggest again that if we just wanted to raise income tax rates up to raise an extra eight billion, that's not going to be a very popular decision. That's going to be quite challenging. But maybe we could try something else. Instead of raising taxes, how about we raise wages? <laughs> If your income tax is the same, so if income tax rate and your income tax band is the same, but you're getting paid more, then you, you pay more tax. The UK inequality is one of the worst in the developed world. It's the, I know you can't really see it on that graph up there, but it's the, the, the red bar uh, up next to, just, just, uh, just below Portugal. The blue bar there is Norway one of the, the more, more equal countries in, in the EU, or in Europe, sorry. And you can see very clearly on the, on the graph in the bottom there that a more equal society is a fairer society, it's a healthier society, and it's a happier society. So, what Commonweal did in a paper about four years ago now is tried to project what would happen to, the, to Scotland's revenue if we kept median wage where it is, about £24,000 a year, but we reduced income and wealth inequality from where it is now to where Norway is now. So you're taxing the, the folk at the upper end a bit more, you're raising wages for the folk at the bottom. The impact of that would be an extra five billion pounds in revenue. That goes a long way, very, very long way to solving this, this coming problem with the pension affordability. There's other taxes as well. Maybe you know, our economies are changing. They're changing quite rapidly. Automation's coming in. We don't know what the full impact of this is going to be yet. Um, if, the, if the robots come and take all our jobs, we're going to have to do things like maybe tax the people that own the robots, get them to pay their corporation taxes. <laughs> we're going to have to start thinking maybe about land taxes and other wealth taxes. So. The, the, one of the papers that Commonweal produced uh, just a couple of months ago from Professor Richard Murphy of Tax Research UK. Um, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Joy of Tax. Highly recommend it if you're a numbers geek like, like I am. Uh, that looks at all of the, the failings of the UK tax system. All of the loopholes, all of the, the, the avenues for tax avoidance and tax evasion. He estimates that the UK loses about £120 billion a year through tax avoidance through just, you know, the UK not collecting the tax that is due. It's actually quite interesting that um, Philip Hammond, in his budget this week, 
just as you know, the UK is going to really need a bit more of uh, infrastructure to do with customs, if we're leaving the customs union, as, as the Tories keep telling us we are, if we're going to need more investment in international trade, to, you know, global Britain wants to go around the world selling itself, those two departments are suffering major cuts in Hammond's budget. The Department for International Trade looks as if it could be getting up to a 25% budget cut. That, that, that's just strange. I don't know what they're thinking out there. <laughs> probably true. <laughs> they're probably not thinking much about it at all. Yeah, they're, they're, they're so desperate to cut, uh, to, to cut the deficit that they're losing sight of, of what government's actually there to do. So an independent Scotland would have the powers to, to get to grips with the tax gap, get to grips with new avenues of tax revenue, and to reshape the Scottish economy so that it is sustainable and does work for everyone. Another paper that we've produced uh, lately was uh, social on social security options for an independent Scotland. Ultimately, it suggests uh, replacing much of the benefit system with a citizen's income. Um, I don't know if Maggie's planning to talk a wee bit more about that because I know she's, well, you may be a little, I won't spoil too much. <laughs> um, so with the powers of independence, yeah, we could create a very different, but hopefully a better, fairer, happier, healthier Scotland. And getting to grips with the challenges of the pension system is part, very much part of that. So yeah, I've laid out quite a few of the challenges. I hope I've offered at least an avenue for a few solutions. I haven't been able to go into them in huge detail. Uh, as I say, we do have a paper coming out on this uh, relatively soon, basically as soon as I can get to writing it, <laughs> um, <laughs> that is going to explore, explore the things I've talked about here today in a lot more detail. You will hear more of me, more from me, when, once that's out and ready, and you can, you'll be able to download that from Commonweal's website. Uh, in, in due course. What I would say is that we're not going to be able to find a single solution to uh, the pen pension problem or the pension challenges, I should say. Uh, we're going to need a, a programme of, of policies all working together. And we're going to need policies that run directly contrary to the current UK ideology. So I'm going to suggest that when people are worried about the sustainability of their pensions, then they really should be worried about their, the sustainability of their pensions under the current system. And maybe, maybe together we can find a better way. I'll leave it there. There's some more information on our website, oliversfirst.org. You can find all of our papers in our library. And I hope to get some questions from you um, in, the, in the wee panel session after. Thank you. Are there any um, immediate questions for Craig? Jim? On the population figures, uh, yep. how many have like, been taken into account if you retain independence, the number of jobs that you would be moving back to Scotland? Mm. Yeah, well, these current projections, they don't project things like independence. They don't even project Brexit, which is another big black hole that's facing our, uh, our, our working population. Um, but yes, independence itself will create jobs, will create thousands of jobs. Um, and something that's not talked about very often is, is Scotland has suffered a bit of a depopulation crisis over several decades. You know, Scotland's population hasn't really grown that much since the Second World War. If Scotland's population had grown at the same rate of, as England's population between the Second World War and now, Scotland's population right now would be eight, eight and a half million rather than five and a half. So again, once Scotland's independent and has its own policies to do with uh, immigration, maybe trying to encourage some of the folk or the descendants of some of the folk who have left to come back then we could see uh, some dramatic effects on our working population. Uh, Craig, thank you for that. I found that very interesting and in fact fascinating. But I just want to go back to the streets of 2013-2014. In yeah. uh, my experience out in the streets, and might be shared by some folk here, the pensioners back then, they really weren't interested in what you've just charted out just now. 
they were interested, what's going to happen to my pension next week yeah. if Scotland's independent next week? Yeah. And somehow we didn't either know the answer or we didn't get that answer across clearly. A, a state pension and also if you had a private pension. Hmm. And I, th I suspect that would be the same next time round. Yeah. Um, I think, you. I don't know if George is going to be talking a wee bit about the, the, this sort of thing. I know he's talked about it in the past. Um, but the, 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 the nub of it is your private pensions are a private contract between you and the company and are completely unaffected by um, you know, constitutional arrangements. Uh, and your state pension will get paid. You, know, it, you can argue over wh who is paying it. You have a, you have, you know, right now the UK, you have been paying your national insurance to the UK government. Therefore, your contract for your pension lies with them. Uh, assuming no deal to the contrary, that would continue. The Scottish government might take on the responsibilities in exchange for other debts and assets, but you know there will be no break in your pension, it's private or, or or state. This is a question. Hello, I'm just checking it switched on. <laughs> Uh, following the last question, back in the independence referendum, the facts and figures were available that the pensions would be paid. They would yeah. be paid to people in nearly every country in the world yeah. for expatriate Brits. Also that people were fighting to retain the pension and yet it's the, the lowest pension in Europe. Germans' pensions are about five times as much. They've got an earlier retirement age. And even Ireland had twice the pension you get in the yep. UK. So why were we fighting to retain the worst possible <laughs> pension we could get? Absolutely. It all boils down <laughs> to the success of the national broadcaster and the unionist biased media. The information did not reach people. The information, the facts were there and they were quite convincing facts. But people just didn't get them. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I'll be bringing out in the paper that I didn't really have time to talk about there um, was looking at the comparative pensions across Europe uh, and just putting it into a bit of perspective that, that UK pensioners are not well served by the UK government. You're correct. I don't think it's working. Yeah, there we go. Hey, the whole 40 OECD com countries only Mexico was worse than Britain. Mm. I'll tell you what, I'll, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head. It's still too early on a Saturday morning, but um, I, I, will, I, will, I will look for those comparators. <laughs> um, just a question. What proportion of the population over 65 has only the state pension mm. as income? I think that's very pertinent. Yeah. It's easy for people with other pensions to say, well, our state pension is very, very low. If it's the only thing you have, then it's very important. So what proportion? Uh, I don't know that number off the top of my head. I think I, it's I, very, I, very important for canvassing. Yeah, I do, I do. And, I, and what I, proportion I, further to that, what proportion of that population is female? Mm. In my experience, <laughs> over yeah. half, likely closer to, 70% of the female population mm. over 65 has only the state pension. Mm. That's, that's an important number to draw. But it's important well. to put those numbers yes. to canvassers yes. so that you understand the circumstance of the person you're speaking with. Yes, absolutely. Sorry for scolding. No, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> and I do know that, that pension, pensioner poverty in the UK is, again, one of the worst in the EU. And that will be part of it. In the front. Yeah. Yeah. It's all very well. The UK government's wanting us all to get our private pensions with its automatic enrolment. That's all very well and good, but you've got to have the wages to pay into it. <laughs> oh, um, my, my question relates to um, a, it's, it's a financial question, but it's also a, a social question. Um, I was recently at a meeting to do with the charities in Scotland and the finance of charities, and it was run by the or, run, on behalf, I think, of the Robertson Trust, who are major uh, charity operators in Scotland. And they, they are very concerned um, about the, the, the state of Scottish charities to deliver social care mm -hmm. and the, the financial condition of these charities. And the state depends upon these to deliver large chunks of social care, a care in the community, that sort of thing, which pensioners will need. 
and, and by great irony, apparently, one of the major reasons why the charities are in such a difficult situation is because of their pension funds. Yep. Because being ex-local authority uh, bodies, they come with the assets and liabilities from the local authority into what is a charity situation. And they are the people who are being depended upon to provide the social care which we're all going to need in the next 10 or 15 years. And a large chunk of this charity sector is in severe financial uh, situations. It's been called um, zombie charities. Yeah. Um, can you say something about the veracity of that information and the effect it might have upon pensions and pensioners? What I can definitely say is I opened this talk by saying that the, the, uh, through the 20th century, governments created this idea that they had a duty of care towards their citizens. The UK government seems to be moving away from that idea by off, off booking these responsibilities onto charities. Why, why are we relying on charities to do something that the government used to do and should maybe do? Because uh, we are we're moving, moving these, these debts, these, these financial obligations off of the, uh, the government's accounting book in the name of austerity, in the, main, in the name of cutting the deficit. But the bill still, still needs to be paid. And if these charities collapse, then who picks up the pieces after that? Exactly. There isn't one. I don't, not, that, not as far as I know. Maybe, well, I, I would argue that a lot of these responsibilities should be brought back into government departments. Yeah, the lady had raised the point about people who depend on the pension alone, but there's another group. In benefits, you probably get up to about £14,000 if you're only dependent on a state benefit and a state pension. So people who save and can only afford a small pension are actively contributing to, to get a pension above that, but they actually lose all the benefits. So someone get a, an additional six or seven thousand pounds a year is actually going to be no better off. Yeah, um, this is something that I discuss in the paper we have in the social in social security that a lot of the UK's means-tested benefits. Uh, taper off very quickly if you have any other source of income. So if you try to get a little bit extra, if you, or if you've managed to save a little bit extra, you end up losing so much in benefits that it's not worth doing. And then you lose all those safety nets that come with the, the, the savings. So that's part of the reason why I, um, I argue in that paper that we need to move towards a citizen's income that isn't dependent on income or other factors. You just get an amount you know, for being a citizen of Scotland. And it's a much fairer way of, of, of of dealing with uh, turning, turning the welfare system into an, an actual system of social security. Hello. Right. I just wanted to ask if you have the ear of the current government in Scotland. You know, these mm. ideas are critical, in my opinion, yeah. to the planning for the future pension resources that we were, we're all needing and going to need. How, how is the, Scottish, the current Scottish government uh, receiving this type of research and are they make, going to make use of it? Um, well, I got some very good compliments from Jean Freeman, the Social Security Minister, for my work on Social Security. She has read the, that information. So, so we, we, we have, we, our, our work does make it into the government. Um, and when they come up with their proposals, we, we are involved in a lot of the consultations and a lot of the... the the evidence committees, so we are able to put across our view, and you, you can you can judge uh, how close the government gets to our preferred standpoint or your preferred standpoint as they make their proposals. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. There'll be more, <coughs> yeah. more questions here on the panel. Yeah. There'll be more questions, opportunities for more questions when we have the full panel. Now, it's interesting in terms of this so-called demographic time bomb that people talk about and the way Craig presented it in terms of this dependency ratio is an interesting way of presenting it. And it touched also on the question of uh, taxation. And I read a recent paper um, about uh, tax avoidance of these corporations and how 
Avo tax avoidance is one of the major causes of global inequality because if the tax isn't there, of course, it denies a lot of both developing and developing countries to provide health care, pensions. So this idea that there's no single solution to pensions is, is really important. We've got to take a much uh, wider view. Our next speaker is Maggie Chapman. Uh, Maggie grew up in Zimbabwe, which obviously been in the news this week, uh, and she moved to Scotland in 1998 to study zoology at Edinburgh University. She is the co-convener of the Scottish Greens and rector of the University of Aberdeen. She was councillor um, in Edinburgh for eight years, where she held the finance, pensions and health and social, social care briefs and she was active campaigner in both the Radical Independence Campaign and Green Yes, and is currently a member of the Scottish Independence Convention. Uh, today she will speak on social security and social care, the possibilities for Scotland's future. And she's going to discuss uh, the economic and social changes that we need to take seriously to ensure we are able to treat all of our citizens, uh, regardless of age, with dignity and respect. Please welcome Maggie Chapman. Thank you very much for, for that introduction, John. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, thank you for, for, for being here this morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak. As John says, I'm, I'm from Zimbabwe, and, and maybe it's appropriate I say a couple of words about that um, be, before I kick off talking about social care pensions and, and, and what that means for Scotland. Zimbabwe, until Wednesday this week, had the world's oldest head of state, Robert Mugabe, who, was, who is 93. Um, but you, you might have noticed that they, they appear to be pursuing some kind of youth policy. Um, the ascent to the presidency um, is, is a relative spring chicken, the 75-year-old Emerson Ngagwa. Um, so, you know, if, if Zimbabwe can, can, can shift to the, to the youth, then, then maybe there's hope for the rest of us too. <laughs> Enough of that. Um, thank you, thank you again for, for inviting me, and I, th I think it's really, really great that, that this conference is happening today. I think it's, it, it's very clear that we need to be much more aware of the kinds of conversations, the kinds of uh, people that we need to be talking to over the coming weeks, months, I hope not too many years, um, before we, we have a, 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 our next independence referendum. What, what I'm hoping to do is, following on for, from what, what Craig was saying, give you some ideas of the kinds of things we need to be thinking about, what it is we need to have in our minds as we have conversations with people as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, to start winning, winning over those people who, who voted no in 2014. I'm not going to talk too much about pensions particularly. Craig is much better qualified than I am to do that. But I will say, given, given I've mentioned Zimbabwe, that the UK government from 1965, when um, Ian Smith declared uh, UDI in, in, in Zimbabwe, in Rhodesia, the UK government agreed to pay the pensions of Rhodesia, a pariah state. And yet we were told constantly during Be by Better Together that they couldn't possibly pay. Scottish pensions. So, so there's, there's a real mismatch there, and I, I, th I think that was part of the culture of fear that the UK government and Better Together wanted to, to, to uh, create around independence. And, and we need to remember that because they, they, they'll do that again, and, and we, we need to be prepared for that. I also think it's worth reminding ourselves of the origins of the welfare state. Um, before 1945 and, and, and the end of the Second World War. In many ways, it goes back to Bismarck's Germany. But Bismarck did, wasn't a great lover of the poor. He, he introduced the welfare systems that, 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 that he did to buy the allegiance of people to the state. And he did that very successfully. And we, we see exactly the same kinds of tactics 
being used in the run-up to 2014 and, and since 2014 uh, around, around Scottish independence by the UK government. So, so we need to be aware of that and, and know how to counter, counter that. Because I think, in, in many ways, that's why people, so many people voted against independence. They had their allegiance to the British state bought, and, and we need to be able to, to challenge that. One of the most appalling pieces of negative campaigning I heard in the last few days of the referendum campaign was from a Labour MP. Um, she lost her seat eight months later, so, so maybe there is some justice. But she, she was going around door to door uh, talking to people and if she, if she came across a pensioner, and I overheard this because I was canvassing on, on the same street as her, and she said, if, 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 if you vote for, for independence, you'll lose your pension and you won't lose your pension at independence, you'll lose it tomorrow. I mean, the, 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 the outrageousness of, of that was, was just staggering. But these kinds of tactics are common and, and they worked. We know that uh, the Ashcroft polling data on the night of the 18th of September 2014 showed that 73% of over 65s voted no, um, compared to 71% of 16 and, 70 year, 16 and 17 year olds who voted yes. But I'm not saying that to pit old against young. I, 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 that's not helpful. It's not going to get us anywhere. But what I do want us to think about is why these age differences, where, where they come from and, and why they matter, and hopefully enable us to start talking about generational politics, about things that affect different kinds of, of, of generations differently, be, be, be having those conversations openly and honestly. If we look at why younger people voted yes, I think we can learn some lessons about the kinds of arguments we need to make in order to get older people to change their minds in the numbers we need them to. One of the reasons that young people shifted towards independence so much more enthusiastically th than anyone else was because they'd, they'd already been cut off from the British state. They'd already been left behind. Tuition fees, the end of, a de the end of decent grants, um, for further or higher education, the increased affordability of housing, thanks to the inflation of the housing market, the incre increasing precarity at work with zero hours contracts, the so-called workfare that amounts to little more than, than slave labour, and the lack of investment in job creation, in decent jobs, never mind the swathing cuts to social security and benefits for, for younger people. All of these things and more were indications to young people that the British state really didn't care about them, didn't have any concern for their future. So that same British state was not worth voting for. Um, and, 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 and so they didn't in, 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 in um, majority numbers. So if we then look at, at older generations, in some ways, and this isn't a good thing, but I think we, we need to, to use it to our advantage, in some ways our task becomes easier as life becomes harder. Now, like I say, that's not a good thing, but it, but it is where we are headed. Previously, the Conservative government has worked to protect benefits and support for older people, maintaining the triple lock on pensions, for instance, supporting universal winter fuel payments, and so many other benefits. So for older, older people, perhaps the breakup of the British state meant they might actually lose something, e even, even as we heard earlier, you know, the, the, the sense of, of what that was, or if it really was worth protecting, given that some of the provisions were worse than, than elsewhere in, in Europe, is, is, is debatable. But as, as austerity continues to bite, and as we look at, at best, 1% growth in our economy until the mid-2020s, we can already see the government softening people up, softening us all up, for similar kinds of reductions to age-defined benefits for older people. The, the similar kinds of things that younger people have already experienced. So general, generational politics has become more important, not because younger people want to see benefits removed from older people, so it's certainly not. It's not a them or us or old versus young fight. But I think we can learn about what, what's happened and, and, and uh, 
predict some of the changes that, that are going to happen. Those benefits, the, the, the social security that has been protected will stop being protected because the British government don't, ha don't have really a sense of, of how else they're going to do it without completely alienating their own elites uh, and their own interests. So our response to this has to be one of intergenerational solidarity, a commitment to rebuilding the state that many of you will have grown up in, where there was genuine social, a genuine social safety net and where family wealth wasn't a prerequisite for success in life. So what are the kinds of things we need to think about? We perhaps have an opportunity here because the British state is, as I say, in very deep crisis in which its ability to buy people's loyalty is becoming radically reduced. So we need to approach this in the right way. One of the things I took from Craig's presentation was that ratio of workers to pensioners, a major issue for pension affordability, for finding enough workers to provide the care and support that our ageing population will need. And as Craig did, I think it's worth putting this very starkly. There are a small number of ways to solve this problem. We all work longer. With, uh, and see rising pension age, and we know that's not sustainable, that's not a good thing. We reduce pensions, and we all know that also isn't a good thing. We increase the amount of tax workers pay to pay for pensions, and there are elements in there that, that are, are, are positive, that, 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 are, that are good things, as, as long as, as, as we do it in ways that don't penalise the lower paid workers disproportionately. And, and fourthly, encouraging people to come to what I consider to be one of the most beautiful countries in the world to work and, and open our borders up to immigration. So I, I think we, we are going to have to think about how we take control not only of our macroeconomic powers to be able to restructure tax in a way that is fair but, but allows, us, allows us to generate the, the, the state's uh, finances needed for, for, for care and, and pensions but also how we open up our borders to, to uh, allow and enable more workers to come here. These two options are not going to be possible without independence, I think. Certainly, certainly not, not in, in, in the form of the British state that we currently have, and, and not in, in any kind of form that we see being suggested from, from other Westminster parties. So we need to use our combined forces between and across generations to make these kinds of arguments. Full, macro, full macroeconomic powers, we can restructure tax, we can change our public sector pay structures for the better, we can change our pension provisions for the better, in ways that mean more, more money coming into Scotland's budget for social care, for the NHS, for the kinds of things we know we need. Full control over our borders, as I say, so we can open up our country to those who wish to live and work here and contribute to our society. The kinds of things we can introduce then as an independent country are things like a, a, tr a truly universal citizen's income, something that as Greens we have long advocated. There are various pilots getting underway at the moment, but they are always going to be restricted by the DWP and what it will or will not allow. Until we have complete powers over that, we cannot provide the kinds of things that we know a citizen's income could, uh, could produce. 70% of households in, in Scotland being better off, for instance. Those in the lowest income brackets being most, most advantaged and, and most secured. Our, our inequality would rad radically uh, reduce and it would be brought in line with some of the most equal countries in the world. And, and we can look to Scandinavia to, just to see the benefits of, of equality. And one thing to remember with citizens' income is that income earned in addition to that would be taxed progressively. We don't currently have the powers to do that and the pilots aren't going to be able to deal with those kinds of questions because of the restrictions we currently face. But we also need to restructure how our care system works and how our, our labour market and employment systems work. We need to be able to provide better pay for carers. Care, people who care are undervalued, either if they're in employment or, or, as, or as unpaid carers. And, and we know that these, these are the people who are going to support um, the, 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 those, those of us who, who need care, whether it's because we are, we, uh, we are elderly or because we have, have health or, or other long-term conditions. 
We also need full powers over our employment because we need to, to enable better conditions for, for carers, better conditions for workers. And we also, we also are, are, are going to have to be in the position where we can restructure how work is controlled and how work is owned. And at the moment, we, need, we don't have the legislative powers to change employment law that will allow wholesale cooperatives, for instance. There's a really interesting development in the Netherlands at the moment around care cooperatives. Maybe not something that is, is the obvious target for, for in, in introducing worker controlled um, um, a, 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 in a worker controlled sector, but um, the, the, they are, the, the model is called the Burtzog mo model, and carers actually take control over, over the managing, over the, 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 whole, the whole running of very local community based care systems. So it's a non hierarchical uh, worker structure, pa pay is much fairer across the board. There, you don't have manager interference telling you where you can and where you can't go to work or how many minutes you, you have for travel time. It's, it's all part of a system work, worked out because the people who are doing the work are the people managing the work. So, so there's much, much more direct uh, relationship there. We can't do that with our current legislation at the moment. So, so we, we, need more, we, need, we need to have those powers. And we could then also have the powers over rights for people at, at, at work. There are some in, in employment powers that, that we have in, in Scotland, but nowhere near enough. And it was interestingly interesting during the Smith Commission process, it was the Labour Party representatives on the Smith Commission that prevented full devolution of, of, of employment law to Scotland. So if, if we think that these things are going to change under Westminster, I think, again, we, uh, we, we need to think again. So these are, these are all really important reasons for us to work across generations because, yes, the, the care and pension issues affect older people, but the people who provide the care and provide the tax that feeds into the pensions aren't. And, and so, so we, we have to look at it in, in, in the whole and not get, ourse get ourselves siloed into age or, or sector groups. We need, we need to open up space for, for, for these conversations. And we started doing some of that um, in the run-up to 2014, but we need to do it much, much more. And I, I think Ian is probably going to talk more about this. The best way to, to convince people, in answer to John's third question, how do we persuade more people to vote yes? The best way to do that is to have one-to-one -one conversations with people who you can relate to. It's called peer shifting. So speaking to your peers, to, to people who, who are, who are in, in a similar position to you. So in closing, I want to encourage you, encourage all of us to, to use today to equip ourselves to have those conversations, to go out there, maybe beyond our comfort zones, talking to people we, don't, we, we, we do know, who voted no, talking to people we don't know, whether it's formal canvassing and door knocking or just conversations with people at bus stops or in, in supermarket queues. These are the ways that we are, this, this is the way we're going to win, win, win our independence come, come the next vote. And when we have the positive vision that I know we'll be talking about throughout today and, and over the next coming weeks and months of the kinds of, of care provision, the kinds of pension pr pensions provision, the kind of better Scotland we know we want to have, with that vision as, as the sort of foundation to those conversations, we can convince enough people to vote yes next time. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Um, when she's talking about, you know, divide and rule in terms of the mm. young and the old, I've got a connection with Zimbabwe because um, I, when I was working, I had a colleague who was from East Africa and he said, you know, you British are brilliant at dividing and rule. Because in East Africa, they, they brought in a lot of the Indians from Indian mm -hmm. continent to work uh, in the civil service and the front line in terms of administration. And the way he described it as in Africa, all the hostility towards the issues of the running the state was always at the, the people from India, not the British. And he said it was brilliant in terms of divide mm. and rule. Um, I'd certainly like to know more about this cooperative. Um, and I hope you can leave us details about mm -hmm. that, Maggie. And um, so, uh, 
Are there any questions, immediate questions for Maggie uh, at this point? There's a lady in the, down here. So, could you? Jan, look at the just lady with the red uh, top on. One, two. Uh, hello, Meg, Meg Lindsay, Isle of Cumbria. Um, I was very interested to hear you talk about the loyalty to the British state because I think that is the biggest issue that underpins how people voted in the older generations. I think that um, it's actually for us, that's where Pensioners for Independence comes in, in my view. It's why I'm interested because we understand what it was like to be brought up to believe that the British state was a good thing, to believe that the empire was the best empire, that it was the one that cared for its people. And we can identify with that. It's not going to be won by the economic arguments with which I totally agree that you're talking about, but that's what's scaring the older people because they feel the world they grew up in is disappearing, the old certainties are going, and immigration terrifies them because it brings indifference and they feel they're too old to cope with that and they want to cling to what they understood, which was the safety of the British state. And we have to go back in our minds to why we felt like that. Why, when I was a kid, did I stand up at home when they played the national anthem at the end of the television? Which I did. Why did I do that? If I can get back in touch with that and sympathetically try to win people who are coming from that loyalty and the fear of the change, then we may have a chance. But the unionists are doing it. There are union jacks on your bread. There are union jacks on your butter. There are union jacks everywhere. There are wall-to-wall -wall television coverage of the royal family. They are already playing this card. Yeah. And then there's a lady on the end there. Is it working OK? Not yet. As now. OK, I've got no doubt Scotland would be a fairer country if it was independent. But to get there, it's going through this um, challenge of the dividing rule. Mm. So you get a situation now as we move towards that is take the example of the bedroom tax. You have to take money out to mitigate something and that's going to continue so instead of being able to invest it it's getting diverted up continually lady just behind i wanted to follow i'm not sure how it works well, um about the cooperatives mm -hmm. and about the open borders mm -hmm. um one of the things that distresses me is that the excluded in Edinburgh, for example, huge population of people who are effectively excluded by poverty, by culture, by a range of things, are never part of the open borders. So we, they're not foreign, they're more Scottish than I am, but they're not included. And we don't address that. Now, we can see that that's also true of a lot of older people. I was very taken by the peer-to-peer -peer remark that you made. In Italy, the cooperative movement is much stronger than here. And the origin of the Dutch experiment is Emilia-Romagna. And it's, a pos it's possible to imagine bringing these things together so that care workers from poorer communities own the care company mm -hmm controlled and are brought into the wonderful systems of education that exist here. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of imagination is really important it's because we need to think about all the borders here that don't require a passport. Um, and I think the last comment I want to make, and I, and I certainly want to hear what you have to say, is. Um, I always have seen it as a choice between staying on the Titanic or being in lifeboat independence. Yeah, the lifeboat's small, the waters are choppy, it's pretty dangerous, you need to know stuff, but the Titanic sank. <laughs> Can I respond to a couple of those? Yeah. Th th thanks very much for those comments. I'll, I'll just respond to, to a couple of things people have said, and then, and then I think there'll be time for more, more questions. I think the, the question about the, the loyalty to the British state is, is it, as, as you say, is fundamental. We need, we need to have the economic information for when people ask, but that's 
the second step. The first step is, is challenging that, and, it, it, and it's profoundly one about identity, I think. And I mean, as, as you say, you know, the the the, the, the labelling of of groceries and that kind of thing as as British, the the, the um, highlighting of of the royal family as as a, a good thing. Um, I, my that's my head still still struggles with that. Um, I, I I think these. In, in some ways, some of that is going to crumble, and we, we need to be prepared to, to pick up the pieces, if, if that's not the, the wrong term. I think that, that there are going to be so many things in the next weeks and months that come out about Brexit that mean that actually this, this British state isn't what people thought, thought it was. The, the vote in 2014, in some ways, was a precursor for, for, for the Brexit vote last year o on some of those questions of identity, of Britishness, of... I mean, we had people talking about the British Empire um, ar around the, 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 Bre the European referendum vote again. I'm like, no, you know, from a post-colonial country, that's not where you want to go. But, but it is, as you say, it, it's the, those kinds of memories, those kinds of very evocative um, uh, sense of... of when thing back in the good old days, and and that's what that's what we need to challenge. And I can't I can't do that. Only you can do that for for, for you know within within generations. You know it, I think it's it's it, it's something that it's quite tempting sometimes to say all you need to do is listen to economists or politicians speak, and and, and they are going to convert people. No, that's not that's not what's going to happen. It's going to be you. You've got, you've got to do this work. We can't do, you know, the people, but those of us on, on the side of the platform aren't, we, we can provide you with the tools to do it, but you are the people who've actually got to do the work. And in some ways, that, that, that's true of, of the issues around the inequalities you raised, the, the bedroom tax. That, that's one example of why we need to do it or why, why we need to make the shift away from a, a system where we only have a limited amount of money to divvy up and if we want to mitigate the bedroom tax, something else loses out. That it shouldn't be an either or. It should never be that kind of either or, or, or option. On on cooperatives and, and, and the borders you talk about that exist within within our own own communities, I think that that's that's really important. There will be people here who know more about the the care co-ops that, that I've talked about, but I can leave I can send John links for further information so you can have discussions about this amongst yourselves as well. But I think so much of this comes down, I think quite starkly, to we, 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 we tend to be quite good at talking to ourselves. And I think part of that peer shifting is peer shifting beyond our comfort zones, beyond, beyond the normal suspects. And that, that, that's breaking down boundaries of class. It has to be breaking down boundaries of, of race and ethnicity too. But I think actually, fundamentally, class, class is quite an important one. And there's an emancipatory power in that as well. As you say, if we say to communities, you can control this. You have the knowledge. You have the expertise. You've been told for 40 years that you don't. But actually, you do. And, and we, here's the support to enable you to do that. So the conversations are important. But we, we then need to ha have the support to, to back, back it up as well. There's a gentleman, uh, you have a question? Yeah. Alan, get the mic. Gentleman with a scarf. As far as I know, with regard to the citizens' income, the Westminster Department concerned has already vetoed any form of trial programs or anything like that. And I just wonder if we're just talking about something that we need independence to do. Shall I respond to that quickly? I, th I think um, for us to do it as Scotland, Yes, we need to be independent, but there are there are currently three pilots underway in Scotland that have taken the, some of the negotiations with the DWP are still ongoing, but the pilots are 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 getting up and running. 
But I think, I mean, I, I, it's great that the pilots are there and the Scottish Government is supporting it. But uh, as you say, in, or, in order for us to implement something like a citizen's income across Scotland, which is actually the only fair way to do it so you don't get border effects, people don't feel left out or, or excluded by those pilots, is, is to implement it countrywide. And the only way to do that is through independence. Sorry, Jim. No. Hi, ah, that's it. Um, this isn't a question, it's an anecdote. Um, we were in one of the footbridges in Rutherglen for the Bridges to Independence, and f the week before was when we discovered that the Queen had some of our money in tax havens. A chap wandered past us, shouted up at us, the Queen pays your gyro. <laughs> so I thought that was a loyalty aspect we might think about. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jim. There's a gentleman at the back there. Um, this will be the last question until the panel question. I, I think that when we're talking about persuading people, uh, to me, one of the key issues is democracy. We're told that we're four nations living within the United Kingdom. But if that was the case, where's the equality? If each nation is equal, then there either ought to be a right to veto something they don't like, or you ought to be able to opt out of something like Brexit, or there ought to be some kind of a unanimous decision. When you think about it, we've got 18 seats in Northern Ireland, we've got 40 seats in Wales, and 59 in Scotland, and 533 are English. Now, does that sound like a democracy to you? You know, when you really think about it, people talk about the United Kingdom, and they talk about um, Westminster. It's really an English parliament. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's an English parliament. Uh, yes, I think it's the easy answer. But, but how, how we challenge that, given, given that it is what we've got. And I mean, I, I, think, I think it is a myth. You, you're right. We don't live in a in a in a in a, a, a true democracy. Partly, and, and, and I think that there are there are things that we can be doing now about that. And it's about citizen engagement as in democracy as something that is more than just about going to a polling station on a rainy Thursday in May and putting an X or a one or two or three in a box. Um, democracy has to be seen as something we do every single day in our everyday lives, in our workplaces, in our care homes, in, 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 our, in our, our, our local shops. And it's about democratising all of our institutions that we engage with. So, so it isn't just that thing over there, that parliament in London, that, 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 that we think of when we think about democracy, or even that parliament in Edinburgh that we think about um, when we think about democracy. So, 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 so that, that's another thread to these conversations we need to be having, uh, or you need to be having, whilst maybe we focus on, on trying to open up things and, and allow uh, you know, more democratic workplaces, more, more democratic governance of, of our public institutions and a whole range of other things like that. We, those are some of the things we are doing and we can be doing now. Thing. Here's, here's the key thing. You know, we look for arguments to persuade people. Everything we try to do, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, whether it's the Iraq war or pensions or the rape clause, it doesn't matter what it is, it gets shot down. Now, all we have to do is present to the public some of these things that they think are worthwhile and explain to them very simply, we are powerless. We don't have the political power to make this happen. So we've got two choices. You know, we've got, we've got our team of SNPs down there and they do their best, but they get hammered all the time. This is not a democracy. And I think a lot of people in Scotland do not realize really what is happening, you know? And so I think that's the crux of this whole argument. If we all go out and we tell people, 
do you think you're living in a democracy? You know, a democracy is where you have an equal say. It's not where 533 people can overrule anything you do. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, if it's Trident or whatever. You know, look, look at all the SNPs that just signed everything saying we don't want nuclear, you know, weapons. What happens to that? It just disappears. So... Mm -hmm. uh. I think, can I just say, that the one of persuasion is, is going to be the big issue yeah. we're going to be discussing this afternoon. I'll just take one more question before bringing the next bit. There's a lady in the third row, just in the front here, Alan. Hello? You can certainly know. <laughs> I, last, I know in the last... Has it gone? That's no, it. we're here. I know in the last independence... For, for, oh. <laughs> Try another one. Two, one, two. Does this one work? Yes. yes. Yeah. In the last independence referendum, Alex Salmond always said that a positive campaign is always much better than a negative campaign. However, thinking of the analogy of the Titanic and the lifeboat, how can we demonstrate without it seeming negative that what is happening down south is sinking? It's more or less finished. We're not going to get anything decent out of Brexit without it appearing negative and critical of the way things are. And that the best option is to go for an independent Scotland where we're in charge and we can shape things ourselves. I think, I think that, that that's a really, really good question. And it's a very big question as well, um, because it speaks to a whole range of different issues around not only identity of, of Scot Scotland or, or of Britain or, or anything like that, but also of those, of those people, and there are, are a lot of them, and I think many of us in this room will include ourselves in this, who have a sense of solidarity with people south of the border and don't want them to sink. So, so I think one, one of the ways that, that we deal with that is to say, if Scotland does this and we get it right, and that's, a, that's not a foregone conclusion, that will require a lot of work, but Scotland can, and can kind of um, prefigure the new world that England, Wales, Northern Ireland, other countries can, can, can learn from and, and can follow, and, and, and we can sort of carve, carve the way for, for, for some of these ideas. Now, that's, that's maybe quite a daunting task, but it, 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 turns, it turns around that negative, you just thinking you're lost. Because you know that that's that's there are people w with familial with other links to to people elsewhere on these islands that don't want to just turn their back on them. And I think we can't afford for this movement to be seen to be turning its back on anybody, um, anybody else in, in in the UK. It's about saying, let us lead. We've got the opportunity here. Let us show you what kind of different Scotland we can create, and therefore show show you the steps. For, for making things better for for regions of England, even you know, I mean, it's it's not it's not as if the north of England hasn't been completely left behind by the British state either. So so there are things that we, we can do that we can then pass on or, or pass down to them and say, here, try this. It's worked for us. You can do it too. Thank you very much. Speaking about things that are failing in Westminster is maybe a good segue for our next speaker. Uh, George Caravan is a Scottish journalist, economist and Scottish National Party politician. He was MP uh, for East Lothian from 2015 and until the snap election uh, this year. He's held academic positions including senior lecturer in economics, specialising in energy economics. He was associate editor of The Scotsman, and as most of you will know, George contributes a regular column in The National. So with the budget this week, um, it's an opportune time 
to do, discussing the economic <coughs> case uh, for independence. As George mentions in the column which uh, he wrote on Thursday, uh, Wednesday's budget was confirmation uh, that UK economic growth for the next five years is going to be less than uh, 2%. And George also picked up, and I haven't heard anyone else mention this, he mentions in his column that Philip Hammond said nothing about pensions. And I think, you know, that deafness uh, uh, is really uh, telling. So today, George will be explaining why the economy of an independent Scotland uh, is, a good, is good uh, for pensions. Please give a welcome to George Caravan. <laughs> My bus pass. <laughs> so I have a stake in this discussion. Um, uh, it's so nice to be speaking to a young audience um, today. Um, uh, I'm going to look at the Scottish economy very quickly in, in, in some numbers. Now, I, I, I've been impressed by Donald Trump. Now, of course, the man's a lunatic. Um, but all during that American election, he just brushed aside the media and he just went on and on with this optimistic, America can do this, America can do that, we are great. And I think, and I, you know, it, it goes back to my childhood. I, I, I've come back to believing just how bad the Scots are at believing in themselves. And I think one of the ways we do the engagement that we're talking about is just not to keep on the back foot trying to deal with whatever lies the BBC have put up but to just have confidence in yourself and start telling people how good we are. And if you start with the very simplest proposition, we are the 15th biggest economy in the world in terms of um, uh, output per head, income per head. Now, it varies from year to year. This, the, the, the figures are always a few years behind uh, the time, so it's 2014, so things have happened with oil and so on. I know all that. Um, but basically, we are one of the rich Western industrial countries. And why are we rich? It's not because some nice American company has come and invested here. Every year, the economy reproduces itself. It makes things. It delivers services. It does that because there are people in a particular place with particular skills who get out of bed in the morning and work. The economy is based on labor, the value of labor, and what it produces. We are the fifth... We are the 15th biggest economy in the world because of the skills, the passion, the commitment, and the activity of the Scottish workforce. The workforce now and the workforce in the past. So when you get someone on the doorstep who says, oh, are we, are, can we survive in, if we're independent? Are we not too poor? You say to them, you spent you know, decades of your life creating this country, producing the wealth of this country, making this country the 15th richest country in the world. Of course we can survive. You contributed. You did it. We can still do it. We have to get that across. Ah, here's what people will say on the doorstep. What about the deficit? Here's the latest deficit. The deficit between what um, is spent by the public sector in Scotland on everything, schools, wages, um, uh, pensions, etc., etc., and what we take in taxes. Uh, the deficit, uh, latest figures last year, £9.6 billion. Pounds. So how do we get the, fill, fill that deficit? Now, we can have arguments about whether, whether that's the right number or not, but let's just take that as the number, right? How could Scotland um, fill that gap between what it spends and what it raises in taxes? Where would we get the money? Um, you know, we've not always had a deficit. This is quite recent. From when North Sea oil started coming on shore uh, in the mid-70s to just, you know, half a dozen years ago, less than that, four or five years ago, Scotland ran a persistent budget surplus. Now, most industrial countries run a budget deficit. The UK has a huge budget deficit. The UK normally runs a budget deficit. For a country for 40 years to run a consistent budget surplus is practically unheard of. 
Scotland was unique in that circumstance. Now, the numbers before the, the, the 60s, uh, things weren't calculated in the same way. I've tried to do a bit of number crunching. Um, but I reckon even in the period from the 50s through to the beginning of the 70s, Scotland was running a budget surplus, taking more in in tax than it was spending. The surplus, of course, going to the rest of the UK. Uh, in the days when we had big, you know, big shipyards, big steelworks, we were a major industrial uh, uh, a manufacturing company, um, we, Scottish companies paid a lot in in tax, and that added to the surplus. So since World War II, basically, apart from the last few years, Scotland has been in budget surplus, a very rare thing. So on that background, it tells me that Scotland can well look after itself. OK, what's the current problem then, people say on the doorstep? Well, the oil money has gone away, the oil taxes have gone away, which, of course, they have. And indeed, um, the latest figures last year, we only took in £208 million pounds in uh, tax revenues from oil and gas compared with £10 billion in 2008. And we're unlikely to get back to that £10, 10, 10 billion. Um, in the medium term. So people then say, well, OK, Scotland can't afford to be independent because it doesn't have the oil money anymore. OK, here's a wee problem. We're still getting oil and gas out of the ground. We are still, the companies, the oil companies are still selling the stuff. Last year, they sold £17.5 billion pounds worth of oil and gas from the North Sea. Now, any company that was, had sales of £17.5 billion and was only paying taxes of 208 million, you'd be saying to yourself, con, how are they not paying their taxes? The reason is, of course, that when we originally, when the British government, originally Harold Wilson originally, um, sold the oil licenses, they were so desperate, they were so feared, that they couldn't get the oil companies to come into the North Sea. They did a deal, the way the taxation works is currently we're giving so many tax concessions to the oil companies, that they're not paying any taxes. It's not that they're not getting oil and gas out of the North Sea. This is what you have to get across the doorstep. It's not that they're not selling it. It's not that they're not making a fortune, 17.5 billion. It's not that they're not paying the shareholders. They're not paying the taxes. Under an independent Scotland, I think we would start to change the taxation. I don't see why they should have all these tax concessions. In fact, actually, I don't see why they should own the oil. I think we should do what the Norwegians do and run the oil companies ourselves and keep the profits. I'll tell you, one of the first things that an independent Scottish government could do would be to change the current tax structure so that rather than getting £208 million pounds tax a year, which has nothing to do with the, full, with the ship, with oil prices, to do with the tax structure, we could get a bit more. Here's another thing. Let's look at Ireland. A smaller population Scotland, doesn't have any oil, doesn't, hasn't got a little, oil, little gas, but nothing very much to speak of. Um, a country that depends entirely on its own hard work and effort. Irish VAT income last year was, was 11.2 billion pounds. Scottish VAT income was 9.5. How can a weir country with a smaller economy take in more VAT? It's not because VAT is particularly higher in Ireland, it's not because their standards of living are lower. Um, it's what they apply VAT to It's different. Now, if you buy a washing machine, you pay VAT. If you buy a private jet to fly around, you don't pay VAT. There's something wrong with our VAT structure in the UK. Let's change the VAT and let's take the taxes in uh, where we can actually um, get the money to pay the pensions and pay the social security. Here's a more interesting one. Irish corporation tax last year. The Irish, remember these Irish were always told, Ireland, you know, they give all these, you know, uh, concessions to companies so they don't pay their taxes, don't, they don't have to pay corporation tax. And actually, and base rate corporation tax in Ireland is very low. Uh, and of course, they let off um, Google and all the big, big, big multinationals, um, so they don't pay a lot of taxes. But actually, corporation tax receipts in, in Ireland, public of Ireland last year, 6.5 billion. In Scotland, according to the JERS figures, it's only four. I'll tell you what's happening is that companies that do activity in Scotland are registering and paying their corporation tax down south, and it's not being uh, registered in Scotland. It's just a tax dodge. And if we were independent and the companies operating in Scotland paid their taxes in Scotland, we would be getting more corporation tax. 
In fact, corporation tax is too low anyway. I mean, companies are not, I mean, they're, they're, we could make them pay more. In fact, we've, we've cut corporation tax in the UK over the last half dozen years. It doesn't actually mean that we've created more, more um, economic activity or more investment. Actually, industrial investment is falling at the moment. We could, without changing the level of economic activity, we could take in more corporation tax. Now, if you're quick, that six, if it's, if, you, know, if, if, you know, the extra that we could take in in VAT, um, the extra that we could take in in corporation tax if we're independent, and the, um, the, the extra we could take from OCR, you've already got rid of that 9.5 billion deficit. So don't tell us that we can't uh, pay our own way. Let's look at trade. Scotland runs a trade surplus. We I export more than we import. The tune uh, currently, it varies year to year. It's currently about 8 billion on the latest numbers. It's very difficult to calculate this, and I've got a little kind of um, animus with, with some of the Scottish government figures, but I, I think it's roughly about, about 8 billion. The UK deficit is 43 billion last year. 43 billion more imports than exports. Of course, that includes the Scottish trade surplus. So we're just talking about England. The English are even worse. I mean, their, their, their deficit's way over 50. So if you are importing more than you're exporting, how do you pay for it? The real deficit is with the UK and with England in its trade activities. It's not with Scotland. We pay our way. We sell more out with Scotland than we, um, than we um, buy from abroad. We, we get income from our sales to the rest of the world. Um, that could be higher. Actually, we are, our, 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 our trade surplus is, is quite moderate compared to Scandinavian countries, um, um, uh, Holland and so on. Um, if we were independent and could actually um, in, engage with the economy and expand the economy the way we should, then that trade surplus would increase. That ultimately is how countries in, um, in the small industrial countries in the rest of Europe can pay higher pensions because their trade surplus, their ability to sell to others at a premium um, is better than they, in the UK where we have that, that trade deficit. Now, here's a number I want you to conjure with. We all know about the Norwegian Pension Fund. Come back to that in a minute. Um, when we found North Sea Oil, SNP argued for, back in the 70s, uh, a sovereign wealth fund. Don't just um, spend the tax money that comes from, an oil, from oil. Let's bank it, save it, build a, a, a wealth fund who we can use later on to fund social uh, spending, including pensions. We didn't do that, so we're, we're, we are, we are um, um, we're starting from scratch if we're independent. But um, if we had our own currency, here's the, here's, the, here's the trick. If you have your own currency, um, when you sell abroad or when companies bring money into Scotland for investment or when people bring savings back or when people bring pension money back into Scotland, if we had our own currency, they would have to take the foreign currency coming in and buy Scottish pounds in order to spend here, pay the taxes here. That foreign currency would end up being owned by the Scottish Central Bank and the Scottish Government. And you would start to be able to run that up into a sovereign wealth fund. Now, <clears throat> quick um, own calculation here. Um, but if we were taking in about 20 billion, um, in currency coming in to Scotland from our trade surplus uh, and from other receipts coming in, and that's converted in, that, that foreign currency ends up in with the Scottish Government, and we put it and we don't spend it, we save it. We end up with, you know, over t 20 billion a year, over a decade. I think we could have a sovereign wealth fund of about 200 billion within a decade. The Norwegian pension fund, their sovereign wealth fund, they started in the early 90s, is now... 750 billion, the largest sovereign wealth fund in, um, uh, on the face of the planet. Now, what the Norwegians do, of course, is they, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a savings, a national savings, if you like, and they then draw on the income from that. And the income is not some piddling couple of percent. Because you're investing um, in stocks and shares, I think you're looking for a return 15%, 20% a year. Um, if we had, a two, within the decade... Here's my contribution to the pension debate. If you know, we had a sovereign wealth fund of 200 billion or thereabouts within a decade, um, that would be providing um, 10 to 20, depends on the state of the world economy, let's say 10, 12 billion 
return uh, uh, a year, that is more than enough to pay the 7.7 billion in state pensions that we are currently um, using in Scotland as we speak. So, yes, I mean, Greg has mentioned some options in terms of, you know, raising the working population through immigration, through um, changing the tax structure, etc., etc., in order to meet um, um, state pension demand and the growth in state pension demand, it will grow. But the point is, if you have a sovereign wealth fund, then you can begin to find another alternative, which is to use the sheer in income from that wealth to, to support and pay, and actually pay your way. And I think this is an interesting policy question. We have adopted, because by force we are, we are within the UK system, where pensions are paid as you go by the existing workforce uh, contributing, and that pays to uh, keep existing pensioners um, um, in funds. But if we actually tried to move away from a pay-as-you-go to a funded system through a pension, through a wealth, from wealth fund, then we would be better able to, to deal with the ups and downs of the global economy. Now, 7.7 billion, of course, um, um, that, that comes currently from the Treasury. We've already discussed part of the issue of what happens if you have independence. That's a legal entity. That's a legal requirement. You, we all in this room as pensioners, we paid in to, um, through our national insurance. Um, that's the legal obligation now for the UK government, the UK Treasury, to pay our pension. If we were independent, that legal obligation would continue. Of course, um, as with people living out with um, 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 the UK now, uh, UK Treasury would probably refuse to increase um, the existing rate of pension as it does with um, UK citizens who've moved abroad. So that would fall to the Scottish Government. And the Scottish Government, of course, would have to pay state pension as people were, uh, came into the system from the moment of independence. But that, so that's an, that would give us the time period to grow the economy. But the interesting thing about that 7.7, .7, which would still be being paid by the Treasury post-independence, if you take that 7.7, .7, of that 9.9 .9 deficit. The real deficit being supported in Scotland as we speak is really only a couple of billion. And I think that means that with the minimum of taxation effort, um, we move to this number here. I think an independent Scotland would start with zero deficit. It, our taxation would cover our outgoing. Very few countries could say that. That would be an extraordinary situation. That would really shock the world markets. Here's these guys, we've been told these guys can't pay for themselves. Hey, they've got a budget, you know, they've got, a, they've got balance the books, which George Osborne and Philip Hammond have said they were going to do for years and years and never could manage. We would start off in an extraordinarily strong fiscal position. My my advice to us would not be to rush off and spend like nothing on earth. My advice would be to say, let's, let's build on that. And particularly, let's build on a situation and try and move to a situation where we pay people decent pensions and where we try and actually fund it from past investment rather than from a pay as you go system. Everything to play for. We are, because of who we are, because of what we've done in the past, because of the work you put in, one of the strongest economies in the world. Let's get the benefit of that before we die. Thank you, George. Um, you know, economics is a discipline. It's got that reputation of being the dismal science, but I don't think there's anything dismal about the presentation George gave us, and I think there's lots of ammunition there to help us make the case for independence. And I think one of the things that came up in the budget, and I can't remember the figure, but they've also discovered more reserves uh, in North Sea Oil was part of Hammond's document buried somewhere. Whereas uh, 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 before it, it was it significantly more oil than found in the North Sea. The oil and gas companies always lie about the reserve. Yeah. There's lots there. They hide it. And uh, over the same period, you know, in terms of taxes, 
Norway has gathered far more taxes than the UK. So, immediate questions for George from the audience. Gentleman in the corner there. Alan. Thank you. I was at the Scottish Independence Convention, so I heard George speak at it, and uh, Craig. I don't remember. Did you speak? Yeah. Okay. Um, there are things in George's presentation today that I think tie in with his own presentation at SICK, Craig's at SICK, and something, and Catherine Trebek's at SICK. So I think I'd actually like to ask all three of you, um, George, what are the ways that, what are the things in your presentation to the, today that tie in with the case you made at SICK for a Scottish currency? Um, Craig, I think when you were talking about the, the GERS figures, I think you probably could add a few things to what George has said with regard to the, the deficit, other ways that the, the, the deficit Scottish deficit could be lowered. And Maggie, this is perhaps more your thing. Catherine Trebek, fantastic presentation, which you'd all agree she made. And she questioned the focus on GDP in economic planning. And I wondered if you might like to say something about that. Um, currency, I mean, I think you can't divorce currencies from this, this discussion. I mean, I. I What's the point of being independent if we don't have our own currency, frankly? Let's get to the bottom line here. If we don't have our own currency, we're in thrall to the banks in London, as we are at the moment. Um, if we don't have our own currency, we can't create the kind of sovereign wealth fund that I'm talking about. Um, if we don't have our own currency, we can't control our, our trade. And we need, to, I mean, ultimately, the way we earn our living and pay our pensions is to trade abroad. Um, so currency becomes, becomes a core issue. Now, I know the Scottish Government is reconsidering this matter and we've got the, the Growth Commission going to report and so on and so on. Um, but, you know, um, you don't, it, 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 it's a basic policy decision. You don't, need, you don't need the numbers. It's a political decision. It's a political choice. If you want to be independent, really independent, you have to have your own currency. Have your own currency, then you can have the economic policies that allow you to do the things you want to do in, in the long term, which involves, of course, being able to pay decent pensions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. Middle table mic. That's on. That better. Right. Um, yeah, as I, say, as I said in the, the SIC conference, a lot of things change. Um, just becoming independent, one of, the big ma one of the major ones is a lot of the reserved government. Um, you know, your civil servants working in the Scotland office, and for, for instance, their duties come back to Scotland and we have to get new civil servant jobs in Scotland. We're still paying their wages. Might be a bit cheaper because London wages are extortionate and London offices are extortionate even compared to Edinburgh. Um, so we're still paying out what we're paying right now, but now those civil servants are paying income tax in Scotland, they're paying VAT in Scotland, they're supporting Scottish businesses, um, and they're, they're gro growing the economy. And that has an impact on our budget line as well. So, um, so yeah, yeah, just the act of independence, you know, it creates jobs, it boosts the Scotland economy. And, and very briefly on, on GDP, I think, Catherine has, has talked about this for a long time. Um, what, one of the biggest problems with it is it measure, it's a measure of um, economic exchange, not all of which is good. And also, it doesn't measure the things that do, do matter and do contribute to human well-being and, and, and to, to happy, healthy communities and societies. And I think one of the examples I've, I've always liked to use in this, a 20-car 20, 20 pile-up on the M8 is good for GDP because you have people who have to fix the cars, you've got people who've got to patch the roads if the, if the road gets damaged, you, you, you know, all, all of those things. And yet, and yet that's not good for anybody. You know, having a motor car accident is, 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 is never a, a good thing. And yet GDP thinks it is. 
And, and that, that, that's just one very small example, and okay, quite a glib example, but of, of the lunacy of, of, of that as a measure of any kind of economic success. What, what, what we have in an economy that, that, that functions primarily with, with GDP as its indicator, the things that matter aren't measured. So all the unpaid care that so many of us do, that, that doesn't account, isn't accounted for in GDP at all. Uh, and yet it, it's what keeps many people alive. And, and, and so we really, we really need to restructure the, the, the indicators and the measures and what we measure in, 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 our, in, in our new economy. And I think Oxfam and others have been doing work on, on, on well-being indices, on, on humankind, on the Oxfam's as the humankind index. You know, I, I, breaking away from GDP is going to be very difficult, and I, I'm not sure we'll get away from it completely. But we do have to build in uh, other mechanisms and measure the right things, the things that matter, the things that are about humans living well, humans being happy, humans being well cared for, not car crashes on a motorway. OK, I want to uh, bring in our fourth speaker soon. So I'll just take one question for George from the lady in the red top. Hello. Can I ask, why did the Scottish government appear to welcome the changes that Hammond made to the tax situation in the North Sea. He appeared to welcome it, and what you said, it's only going to be worse and worse for us. Um, okay, um, I didn't say what I'm about to say. Um, the, 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 the SNP, not the Scottish government, the SNP has a, is conflicted when it comes to oil. Right? It's a great natural resource, and we need it. Um, but also, but there are also there are negative aspects of, 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 of the petroleum industry. Um, and I personally don't think we should spend our, you know, the, our time burning hydrocarbons and destroying the planet. I, I, think, I think we need hydrocarbons to make plastics and, and to do all sorts of interesting things. I, think, I still think we need them, and therefore I still think we need an oil an and gas industry. Um, but I, I, I'm against... Um, the, 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 the current policy, which is to get, get stuff out as fast as possible and burn it you know, to, to heat the atmosphere. Um, so th there's, there's a kind of political conflict. And, and so the, the Scottish government is clearly committed to um, maintaining the industry, expanding the industry, creating jobs in the industry. Um, but sometimes that leads to a, 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 a cutting corners. Uh, I, there, there is some merit in um, Hammond's proposal. Which is to which is to actually use some of it to allow some of the tax concessions which exist at the moment, and let them be used by smaller companies, which would actually be Scottish companies, um, rather than just letting them uh, accrue to the big multinational oil companies. So there, there is some merit there, um, but I, I take your point. I think we should be cautious that uh, about just about just embracing any strategy um, that, 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 that expands North Sea, North sea I think we have to look for value. And particularly when it comes to the real, uh, the real growth of the, of, of, of the oil industry, which would be west of Shetland, uh, where we've not tapped the, 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 the big oil and gas reserves. I personally think that, that should be done by a, a public sector Scottish company. Um, we've got to set up, we're setting up a, 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 an energy company, Scottish government setting up an energy company for, for energy distribution. I think we should go the whole hog and actually produce and keep it in, in the public sector. That way, we could control it, control its use, uh, and keep the to keep the keep the uh, uh, keep any of the uh, of the profits for, for for social use. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We hear a lot uh, in the unionist media that Scots don't want a second independence uh, referendum. Uh, and uh, opinion polls, as we know, use sophisticated techniques to shed light on uh, voter opinions and voting intentions. They don't always get it right, of course, we know that. Our next speaker, mm. uh, Dr. <coughs> Ian Black, uh, is going to give us insight into research that is conducted with regard to voting intentions. Uh, Ian teaches and researches at the Harriet Watt University. He's been actively involved in studying the Scottish independence campaign since 2013 and has published widely on the grassroots campaign. Uh, he's also active 
in, yes, Edinburgh and North Leith. And today, uh, he will be presenting his research, which was commissioned by the Scottish Independence Convention that investigated different voting groups um, about their current beliefs, their opinions regarding independence, their thoughts for the future, and critically, what will influence their vote uh, next time. So Ian's presentation is going to be very important backcloth to this afternoon when we start debating social campaigning. So please give a warm welcome to Ian Black. Thank you. Can I rearrange things um, thanks very much for, uh, for, for asking me uh, John um, as, as John was saying I'm a, uh, I'm a reader which nobody kind of knows what a reader is uh, at uh, Harriet Watt University and I'm, I'm used to speaking obviously to, to a younger audience uh, the, the, the difference is by now I can't see anybody on an iPad or a, an iPhone not listening to me so you guys seem to be paying <laughs> much more attention um, which will probably make me much more nervous uh, about the, 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 whole, the whole thing. Can I just jump in a little bit into the debate on the, uh, the economy? Uh, you know, so I'm a business academic. And, uh, um, one of the things I think we've, we've got to be very... When, when I'm speaking to people, when I've been speaking to people on the, 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 the doorstep, and they are quite, you know, oh, you know, our economy isn't strong enough. I think one of the things we've got to be careful, uh, important to do there is to say, yes, and that's the fault of the, of the union. We, we, haven't, we haven't run our own economy. We haven't got the main decision-making uh, factors. And of course, what we talk about a lot is what we could do once we have them. But I think we've got to frame Scotland's um, economic performance in, in the mismanagement of Westminster before we could say they're the ones that made the decisions about infrastructure and about tax uh, and about money, uh, money supply uh, uh, and uh, about uh, what, what we can borrow. But if we had the issues, this is what we could do better. And I think that does come into every year we get the JERS figures, and the JERS figures are now massaged to make us feel bad. And we say, oh, yes, we're rubbish. No, those are a condemnation of the UK's running of the Scottish economy. Thank you. Now move on to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the reason I'm supposed to be, uh, to be here. So I, am, I think it's important to reiterate, I am an, uh, a... Um, a, uh, uh, an activist with, with Yes Edinburgh North and Leith because we're doing qualitative research here and one of the things about qualitative research is that you have to ad admit your own biases. You're not trying to produce something that is objective. It comes from a different ph philosophical um, set of assumptions about the way that the world is created, uh, the, the way the world is viewed. So I have to ad admit that, um, that I am an, <coughs> an, uh, an, uh, um, an, uh, an activist and have been from the very, uh, very start of the Yes campaign. So one of the things that's important to say that all these findings that, that we have were developed with five different uh, uh, analysts, a number of people uh, brought in, so we looked to see what the data um, uh, said. It's not just my biases and preconceptions and looking for words that fit my view of the world, um, that we had a broad range uh, of, uh, 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 of ages and backgrounds and genders uh, uh, looking at this. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> with uh, apologies to those of you who are at the SIC, I I'm going to start with the same gag, um, which was about <laughs> how do you get to Dublin? Um, so, the, 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 the idea here is that a um, chap comes up, uh, he's, in, he's lost somewhere in Ireland, and says, excuse me, um, could you tell me how to get to Dublin? And the response is, well, if I was going to go to Dublin, I wouldn't start from here. Okay. So, um, and I think the importance of that, uh, that, that, that start there is to say that we need to know where we are, okay? We need to be very clear that, that we understand where the voters think we are, not us, not the, the group of people who have been working in some cases. I'm, I'm sure we could have some sort of top Trump game here of the person in the room who's been working for independence the longest. You know, I've been doing it from 56, I've been 54, um, we, would, we would go all the way back. We're kind of not so important at the moment. It's what the voters think, and in particularly those people who couldn't support us last time. I think it's very important for us to frame people in that way, not as in no supporters or yuns or any of the other uh, um, derogatory ways that we talk about them, but those who couldn't support us last time for a number of very good reasons. Okay, so, 
Um, we need to know where, um, where we are, and that's on, the, uh, on that basis is uh, what Harriet Watt, uh, sorry, the, the SIC um, commissioned this research from, from Harriet Watt. So where are the uh, voters? Where, um, what do they feel at the moment? What are their experiences? Um, uh, um, how do they feel? Experiences about the way that they uh, uh, they feel. What we can do with it then, and what we're planning to do, is to have a. Uh, um, uh, we, can, we can then go to a large scale, scale quantitative uh, piece of research um, to see if these things, uh, how how well these do reflect into the uh, uh, into the wider uh, uh, community, into, into into Scotland more generally. And we'll do that with a survey after after Christmas. So these things cannot be said just because half of the people in, in my depth interviews might have said something that does not mean that half of the people in Scotland think these. These are just theory building and, uh, and ideas. So we, we um, spoke uh, to, to groups of people, equal numbers of uh, men and women, ranges from, ages from 18 to 72. There was uh, a, a strong, uh, over half the people were above the age of 55 and a very mixed set of uh, socioeconomic groupings. Is there a spa? There is a spare bottle. It's not because I've got a hangover. <laughs> it's just one bottle of wine last night. Okay. So, uh, where are the uh, where are the electorate? Not not physically, but uh, where are they? Probably reflecting a lot of your own feelings in here. They're overwhelmed, tired. Um, uh, and confused. And I think those are the sort of uh, uh, key things. Overwhelmed by the amount of politics that we've had, overwhelmed uh, by the number of decisions that we've made, um, and critically the fact that these decisions have gone nowhere. These decisions have made things worse. Brexit on a daily basis becomes more confusing. Would that be fair? <laughs> we, you know, I've almost kind of given up trying to follow it. Because I, I, I just there's too much, there's too much, uh, and, I, and I think that actually illustrates one of the issues of when people are tired and confused, we withdraw from the decision situation. How many times have you been in a shop? Um, have you been somewhere where you get overwhelmed by the amount of information? It starts to get confusing, and you just go, you know what? I'll just leave it and walk away. And we've got to think about people in the same context for, for independence at the moment. They don't want to engage with us because it's all too confusing where you just shut up and let me get on with getting through November or getting the Christmas presents bought. Okay. So I think that's it's imp uh, imp important. Overwhelmed by the decisions, overwhelmed by the choice and overwhelmed by the, the, the information and, and unwilling at the moment uh, uh, to, to re-engage with independence uh, uh, politics. Um, I think the important other side is that everybody gets independence. That uh, I suppose there are very few people that we've met on the doorstep who say, you know, I'll just vote the way my husband tells me to vote. We still get those. Still get that. We still get the other ones. I'll tell the, um, uh, the other, you know, the other way around. You know, when my mum and dad, or, or they've always voted this way. That's the way I'll vote. But on the whole, we get independence. We get independence that making decisions for ourselves is a is a better thing. And um, and we even got that down. So the most no group that we spoke to was down in Hoyk. Okay, we went. I, thought I didn't know what I was going to get myself into going down to Hoyk, speaking to to older, uh, 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 mainly older folk down there. But every one of them got independence as well. They understand that making decisions better for themselves. They they saw it very much in a borders context. 
the, the, the borders was only, is only you know, it's next to the, the central belt, but it's a long way away, and they don't feel as though they're able to make the decisions that's necessary uh, for them as a region to flourish. And they went on and talked about um, how the knitwear industry, for example, had collapsed within, uh, within, within the borders, within these towns. Um, so that's surely a gateway into understanding the decisions that, were, that, that uh, should be back in, should be in Scotland's hands so we don't do these things uh, 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 again, that we can build our own uh, economy. So they, there's a very strong message of getting independence, um, but there is very, also an, an element of uh, the dependence of it. I want someone there just in case. I want a bigger entity close by to look, to look after me. So when the kids leave home, you know, they feel safe because they can always ask mum and dad. <laughs> and I know that, that age is getting uh, later and later, so when they're 35 and they finally leave home now, they've finally got enough money to buy a house, um, they, uh, they can, uh, they, there's still mum and dad to help them out. There's still the EU to sort things out. There's, there's the EEA. There so, has to be some other bigger entity, particularly when we go back to this issue of self-efficacy, how, how self-confident we are, how, we, how well we can um, solve our own problems. So as long as we have this self-confidence deficit in Scotland, we're going to need somebody else that we can just rely on a little bit. And that, that's the, uh, that, 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 there is the, the, that is there, that we are not becoming independent uh, fully. We're, becoming, we're going out to be independent, but in an interdependent world, that, that, uh, that there is that uh, larger entity there um, to, to support us. Okay. So... I think one of the other things that we, we examined is, is people's, uh, sorry, oh, I've gone the wrong way, sorry, what have we done here? No, that's the wrong way. Ah, there we go. Um, exp experiences of, of, uh, of independence. We have to under uh, understand the experiences of independence um, because that leaves a very strong emotional mark on us. And we don't, we either want to repeat positive experiences when we think about the future and making decisions in the future. Is that an experience I want to, 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 uh, to relive again? Or is that something that I really did not enjoy at all uh, and I want to uh, avoid? And I think that's something, again, that we as Yes campaigners who might have had one of the greatest periods of our lives in the last uh, six months, etc., into the, 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 the vote last time round, that was not the experience uh, of, uh, of the no voters. So yes, passionate, exciting, but we also picked up for those people who had been uh, uh, yes supporters, um, that they were also there, they weren't yes supporters in a linear fashion. They would move towards yes, and then they'd move back towards no, and then even in the walk, the, the walk to the, the polling station, they had, um, uh, uh, had uh, thought about voting the other way. So we have to really think about the discipline of the campaign right to the very end, and I think it would be fair to say that things got a little bit crazy a little bit bonkers in the last few weeks. We saw some things in, uh, of being, uh, Ed Miliband being jostled uh, that, that got a little bit too much for people uh, and, uh, and may have brought them back. But for the no, no supporters, um, we, we looked for a, a quote here. It was divisive. There was lots of passionate arguments getting flung around. I lost a friend out of it. First of all, we can pick up there. There was quite a bit of the unionist words in those mouths. It was divisive. You know, they, they've won the argument since. By it's divisive. Back to the day job. It was divisive. Uh, 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 their their um, their words are being brought back to us. But um, uh, the the notion of the information was being flung around. It was a com it was confront uh, confrontational, and I've, and I've lost a, a, a friend. So some, some, in, in many instances, some significant emotional barriers to overcome. And the only way that you really um, overcome these sorts of barriers is to change what it looks like in the future, but also just give people time. Time heals. So just give people time away, not showing them the symbols of the, uh, of the campaign from last time to, to, to reiterate. So we need to, uh, uh, to, to, to this, these are uh, the experiences, with the, the positive experiences that we had, the negative experiences that, the, that many of the no supporters had, all the, uh, uh, that, that we have to, to reflect that when we're thinking forward. One of the things that we did get was range of it, that when we talked about this was their experiences. We didn't get a lot of talking uh, uh, about facts looming large in, their, uh, in the reason that they, they um, voted the way they did. So, um, then we look on to the, the type of information uh, that they actually uh, wanted. Okay. Um, here, uh, and I think this is a sort of really, a, a quote that you almost can't believe. 
I think a lot of people would have voted differently if they'd had the right information. Lack of information baffled a lot of people. Can I just maybe just get a show of hands? How many of you um, th think that you gave a lack of information last time around? <laughs> you know, when I went to... <laughs> that, yeah, and that, that, that's the thing. I mean, yes, Edinburgh West calculated that they gave out um, half a million leaflets, you know, which is a phenomenal effort. You know, half a million leaflets. You know, there were 32-page booklets, 16-page booklets, 600-page uh, uh, white papers, etc. But so the, the important thing is that maybe leaflets aren't the, uh, the catch-all uh, and the, the go-to thing we think they are. And, and, the, and the other side is they're not prov necessarily providing the information that, that, that people want. So what else did uh, maybe to reflect on the, the, the past, ca uh, past campaign? Um, the vision for New Scotland that, that, that we provided was, and this is a really difficult one, I came in just as you were ta talking about hope, uh, hope versus fear essentially, that, uh, you know, the, the positive campaign. I do quite a bit of research on this, we're doing some more research with some people from, uh, some colleagues from Cranfield University, and fear is more powerful. As I, um, you know, that we, we're in a situation that fear is more powerful. What the research we're doing is we're trying to find ways of making a hopeful message more resistant to fear, counter-messaging. Because I think that's the position we want to do. We want to have a hopeful vision for how Scotland can get better. But we know fine and well the BBC, led by the BBC and others and the mainstream media, will come in, at, uh, in, in every possible way with a fear-driven message. Last time round we were a bit too much in the way of utopia. There was, a, uh, there was a little bit too much you know, like space unicorns and everything was going to be fine and everything was going to be, be wonderful. And what it ended up being was we created an unrealistic hope. And I think that's a, a, a crucial point. That, that hope has to be possible. And we created one that was a little bit too utopic. So what did they want? Well, uh, I, 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 remember this, I, I remember this um, the, the, uh, this TV programme vaguely um, I'm not sure if any of you remember it better, um, the, the, but the, just the notion of just the facts, man, just the facts. That's what people wanted. We, want, we, wanted, uh, we wanted facts. So just give me the facts. That was the problem, was because you didn't know what was a fact in fiction. So they want facts, but then, uh, then, then we, we, uh, we start to think about what are these things. So what are facts in, in people's minds? We had to dig a little bit deeper on that. They have to be known, trustworthy and undisputed. Known, trustworthy, and, 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 un, and undisputed. But what they were given is not necessarily that. I don't know very much about it, but it was just facts coming from everywhere, and it was like, ugh, this is quite overwhelming, I think. And we get to that point about people uh, um, withdrawing from the, uh, from the decision context because it became overwhelming. We have limited uh, uh, processing capacities, and we have to, uh, 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 and if we, if we overwhelm those, we will just uh, move away or look for information that supports our existing, uh, existing beliefs. So they wanted facts. Facts are trustworthy. Um, facts come from undisputed sources. But uh, in, in more details, uh, statistics are not facts. Uh, with apologies to my, uh, my economist <laughs> to, 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 the, to, to the right of me uh, uh, there, you know. Um, and, and if we think, ab I think about statistics and, and not facts, and we think about those people, and I apologise to George, I think, uh, during my, my SIC presentation about this, um, you know, the, the people who give us statistics aren't particularly trustworthy. Politicians, <laughs> banks, economists, <laughs> academics, <laughs> all, these, all these people that we, that, 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 um, you know, we have this, this notion of, of, of rational economic man that will use facts to make the most, uh, uh, maximise your utility in decision making. And that's just not what we do. We, 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 we're persuaded by our friends and colleagues, by our eyes, um, by the things that we experience, by the emotions that, that we feel. Those are the things that, uh, that, 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 that persuade us. So we need to be very careful with thinking that stats and rational argument it's confidence about the economy. Some people all want to have the detailed conversation of where the money's coming from. The other folk just want to feel confident that, uh, that, that we can move forward. And again, more of us are in that, bait, in, in, that, in that category. So what are facts? They're not statistics. Statistics can be fudged either way, so you don't even trust statistics, the statistics that you hear. I, think I like, really like this, um, uh, I can't remember if I say, well, well, what are the things that we trust? What are the, uh, the sort of facts that they need? Well, you need evidence. People want evidence in front of them. You've got to look at schools and hospitals. Um, what funding are they getting? Mitch, yeah. 
Sam, yes. So these are people who'd move from, from no and a yes to maybe to an undecided position. So life today to them is a fact. That's in front of them. That comes from sources that they can trust, their own eyes, their own ears, their own emotions, or those of their friends. So we all have experiences in this room of public services, and the facts of, um, uh, that, that persuade people are about public services are your experiences, and whether they have been good or whether they've been bad. And I think it's a really interesting thing we're going to have to look at more so, is the power of the conversations that we're having about our public services now to counter the almost relentless negativity that's coming from the, uh, uh, from the BBC, etc., about them. That how do we talk about how good our lived experiences are in the NHS? And maybe even compare them to, down, uh, to down, uh, those down south, if any of you have those friends and relationships who are having to put up with a privatised NHS down south, and compare and contrast how well we're doing up here under incredibly difficult circumstances. But to life today is facts. And I really like that little um, uh, uh, diagram, the, the wee cartoon there. Those are the real unemployment figures. Not the 6.4%, the 2.3%, whatever they are. It's the loss of hope, the sadness, the, 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 the destruction of a future, the loss of a future that unemployment brings. Those are the real figures that come with it. That come with it. So... If the facts today are the health, schools, roads, etc., um, we've got to be very careful about that. That it does put, sorry, that what that does do is bring a lot of uh, implications onto the Scottish government's performance now about how it plans for the future, how it builds the campaign, and the campaign for yes is, is built in how well they're doing their day job now. So the, the conservative view of get back to your day job, you know, get, get, uh, um, uh, is actually a good, is, is, a, is a wise thing, I think, for the SNP to be doing. And they certainly, um, I think, in the last uh, uh, six months or so, have picked uh, up the focus on that. The worrying thing is, though, I think, uh, well, sorry, one of the things we have to remember is that there's a very poor level of knowledge between what's a reserved matter and what's a, a devolved matter. So we're now getting blamed for everything. Okay. Which is, in some ways, and I was speaking to Robin McAlpin about this, and Robin thinks that's a good, a good thing because he thinks that they've given up on Westminster. You know, Westminster's just a basket case full, run by Bampot. You know, that they're, they're almost, almost like a comedy show, a very serious comedy show. And the real stuff's done up here, but it means that, uh, the, that we, we, uh, uh, we, we have a greater responsibility. Um, But if that's what they want, how do they want us to talk to them about it? Um, well, I think the, uh, the, the element of uh, uh, the last time around, there were maybe wrong conversations. There was too much uh, lecturing on doorsteps. There was too many stayed heed rammies going on. There was too many of us that knew too much compared to the people we were talking about. And we wanted to ram home all, their, all the things that they were getting wrong. And, uh, and I really, we really saw this in the, the Inverness discussion where someone who was there who shouldn't have been, it should have been an undecided discussion, people who'd moved from yes and no to, to undecided. And he uh, just came out, he was a Rick campaigner, and he just came out with volumes of facts and, uh, and, uh, about neoliberalism and establishments and, uh, and oil and all that sort of stuff. And everybody just, oh, gee, shut up, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, Pa. Oh, yeah, you're right, Pa. That's, that's right, that's right. And I, I, hands up. I'll put, I'll put my hand up. I got excited and did too much of that. I think one of the things we might have to talk about as campaigners is, finding people's um, skills and using them appropriately, i.e. there are some folk who shouldn't be out talking to the public. <laughs> yeah, you know, just to find the conversations had by those who can listen. Uh, and other people can make sure that, you know, an army, you've got it, that, that figure, an army, there's very few infantry compared to everybody else behind them. And we just got our crack persuasion troops at the top uh, and everybody else in there is in there to support and to make sure that they're, uh, they're, they're speaking to the right people in the, in, in the right way. So we have to turn down the, 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 the volume um, and we have to discuss so the, the idea of an identification canvas where we just found out what people wanted to vote and then walked away. Voters didn't like that. They wanted to tell their why. Why are they feeling like that? So I think we, we need to turn down the volume. We need to start to listen. And this is um, Audrey Burt, who is just a magnificent uh, presentation. If you haven't l uh, uh, listened to that online, maybe from the SIC have picked out her one. I think that's absolutely. If we could clone 20 uh, Audreys and send her around to every yes group in Scotland five or six times so we don't forget the, uh, the, the answer. Um, uh, so we don't, we don't forget uh, the, the, the point she's making. I think that would be really useful. So let's, we'll just move on uh, quickly into uh, 
uh, into whether people feel they've made the, the right decisions. Uh, right or no, if I don't need to, yeah. don't need, sorry, I've, I've drifted. We can pick up on yeah. questions. Can I, can I, yeah, Why can I just uh, quickly break, or maybe just a very quick thing. Brexit, um, we can't make any assumptions about Brexit. Um, it is. Uh, uh, it could be good for Scottish independence. It can. It, it can be bad. People expect there to be a, a, a disaster. The element of where we have to, to, to do is create. Um, sorry, I really was very poor in my timing here. Is create a trajectory towards success where we take the um, uh, people's understanding of uh, of where they are now through the the, the, the plans of current. Uh, sorry, can we just go? With, um, yeah. The trajectory to success is where we are feeling now, how, how we move into the, 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 the pre -refer next referendum period and post. We have to create um, the excellent in our public services and our public service administration to create an understanding of that we're moving in the right direction. And we need to create detailed and localised, hyper-localised plans for the future in order to move people forward uh, in, with, with, with confidence. So one of the, the things I would suggest as an activity, an important part of the campaigning for, for pensioners for, uh, for, for yes, is that hyper-localised, not just in yes, Edinburgh, North and Leith, not just in Leith, but on Leith Walk, not just in, in Forth, down into Pilton, uh, sorry, West Pilton versus uh, uh, Pilton itself. What does uh, independence mean in these areas and how can we uh, uh, convince people that we have the detailed plans to give them the confidence and the self-efficacy um, to, uh, to, to move forward to voting to, for yes? So, I thought we'd get five minutes or something. You did. You did stay. Thank you. Um, yeah, my um, talk, talk there on uh, statisticians and statistics. My favourite definition of a statistician is um, someone if you, who says if you put your feet in the refrigerator, and your head in the oven, on average, you'll be perfectly comfortable. <laughs> um, thank you, Ian. Uh, what we'll go to now, and we've had quite an extended discussion in terms of the speakers, but I do want to uh, keep to the timetable because we have the musicians coming back at one o'clock. Um, I've also just got a message uh, from the parents group they normally close at 12.30, uh, but they're keeping the cafe open until one o'clock. So we want people the opportunity to go out, buy a sandwich and come back. And I know you won't want to miss the musicians and we want to um, start promptly for the afternoon session. So we'll just um, take panel questions at this point and just indicate who you'd like to ask the question to um, and we'll go from there. Any immediate ones for Ian at the moment? Would it be possible to get um, some paper copy of what you've got right here? It's a difficult one. The, the, there are things in there that this is, the things in there we not necessarily want to come out. There, you know, the, this, is a this is a strategy document okay. uh, for things forward. I think we'll get much more, uh, much more will be able to be published from the, the, um, the, the, the survey that we do in uh, January, February. But you know, we don't, we don't want to, we don't let them see everything. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Gentleman in the front here. Yeah, just, just. Hello, is that working? Um, in the political context, Mr. Black, I was intrigued by your idea of the indisputable fact. Can you give an example? <laughs> uh, well, and, and I think the, the issue is that your indisputable facts will be maybe the last time you went to the doctor, that last time that you're a partner, a, I don't know, your, your family circumstances. You know, the, the indisputable facts are those things of your lived experience. They're not what the politicians tell us. They're not to say that growth of 3.6% is good or 1.2%. The, 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 these things are not indisputable facts. I mean, if we go down to research philosophy or the, the, and the idea of that there is an objective world outside our heads, 
Um, the, the, with many a uh, philosophy, philosophy, philosophy tutorials been debating that one. I think the lived ex that our facts are our lives and our experience of getting here today and how we found that and use that as, uh, as uh, to persuade us whether we think Scotland's doing well, whether the SNP government's doing well, whether we think we're good enough to run our own life, whether the promises um, of uh, you know we can do it. Well, if that's in the future. How well are we doing it now? And I'll use that as an indisputable fact for me to be able to, dis to make the decision. So, so I think you know, only, only you have them inside your head. OK. Uh, Jason at the back. Uh, I think an indisputable fact is just a story that's believed. That's an indisputable fact. And you, and you tell a story that's believed by being confident and believing it yourself and, and being trusted by the person that you're telling it to. So these are all the things that we have now. A lot of the things that I'm hearing from people telling you, the things that you're telling us, it, it, I find frustrating to listen to it because I, would, I just want to sit there and tell them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, but do it in a believable, trusting way. Because, uh, again, like the thing there, what is a, what is a fact? There is no such thing. And, and the thing that I keep wanting to say over and over and over again, the thing that changed people's minds the last time was the campaign. It was that they were ready to listen because there was going to be a decision made at the end of it. And so they had to listen. And at the moment, there is no campaign and there isn't going to be a decision made to the end of it. So nobody is motivated to sit and listen. And until that campaign happens, the environment isn't there to, to, to be trusted and to be listened to and to be taken seriously. And that's, that's, that's part of uh, us getting ready for the campaign. You know, that, that's, that's what I think. I, we don't have no control over when the campaign is. <laughs> I, I, and I think that was, if we were going on to where we should be spending our time now, you're absolutely right. Those conversations about your lived experiences to those people who are ready to listen um, and, uh, uh, is, is essential. But then that other, the other element of now is that we've got to be planning, not campaigning. You know, and, I, and I think that, that's, that's really important. My, la my, last, my last slide was, um, if I'd noticed that I had a five-minute warning and I didn't, um, was to take it down to... To that, rather than the, uh, that's the, the, the picture on, the, on your right there is the, the visual that was used for, the, for, the, the, um, uh, for, for this conference. But whether we, we need to be spending less of our time thinking about being on the streets, chatting to people, and more time getting our escape plan sorted. I mean, thinking, making it, uh, 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 that those, those detailed plans locally are what, what we're doing to have those conversations um, in, in a way at the right time to the right people. Story yep, story, absolutely. And that's, you know, Audrey. Yep. Absolutely. If gathering the information you need locally to tell a local story that is very effective, then it's going to be the best. Thank you. The gentleman there. Probably a question, it's a combination of Ian and your, uh, one of the most difficult challenges or questions I had during the referendum was you had the fact of a vote, you had the fact of a result and had we become independent, there then would have been a challenge about the division of debt, assets and so on. The question I kept getting is how do you pay the bills on day one? Where is the money coming from? It, it, it's not as if the UK was going to agree to everything, and you had a fixed period. I didn't have a good answer to that one. George? <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> no, the, but the, 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 there was an agreement with, with the UK government that there would be the two-year transition period. Now, you could argue that might not have been long enough um, but there was an agreed transition period, so part of that was taken care of. Um, but I think, I think you, you, make a, you make a serious point that you, that, that you need to be as prepared beforehand as you can. Um, and I, I had this, I've been having discussions 
over the last year with our friends in Catalonia because they were running up to uh, what was not an agreed referendum. Uh, and I was petrified. I was saying, what have you put in place? And, and they had put some things in place. They hadn't put other things in place. And we were having big discussions about their central bank because they would need a central bank right away. Um, so um, the transition, I, you can't run away from that transition, does, does raise some problems. We are a much better position now, given we've got a Scottish government than we were you know, pre. I mean, if, if, you know, if we'd gone for independence in, in, the, in the 70s, we'd been, you know, been banged right away. So yes, um, you, can't, you can't deny that, that, that preparation is in place, has to be in place. We're, we're even better now than three years ago because you know, we're starting to create the structures of our own um, social security system. Um, so it's just getting closer and closer to at some point, you know, all, all, the, all the bricks will be in place. Um, but I've been, I mean, I, I have been arguing very strongly with the Scottish Government at the moment is that if, if they are thinking of accepting the idea of a Scottish currency, then we have to set up now um, uh, essentially a skeleton central bank. We wouldn't call it that, call it a monetary institute or something like that. But you have to set up some of the institutions now to be in place for when, when the time comes. But you're never going to avoid some kind of you know, 18 month, two year transition period. Uh, lady in blue here. Thank you. Um, it's a question on pensions. Um, so probably Craig and George. Um, I've recently retired from the NHS and so I'm in the wonderful position of having um, public pension and um, I realise that there are many people in similar situation retiring from the police and fire service and so on. And I just wondered if you take an account of public pensions as opposed to just the state pension. Because um, the figures I've written down here, 7.7 um, .7 billion per annum coming from the UK Treasury for state pension. Um, as far as I'm aware, my NHS pension is funded from SPPA, which is Scottish Public Pensions Association. So. Um, that's one question, you know, is that taken care of, kind of thing. Because um, I'm a WASPy, I don't get, my, um, <laughs> don't get my state pension for another three years. Um, uh, but lucky me, I can retire on my NHS pension. Um, and my husband's in exactly the same situation, so we'd be really struggling um, uh, if, if, you know, we didn't actually um, uh, continue with the same um, public pension. The other thing I was a wee bit confused about um, was uh, the kind of transition between uh, the state pension for people who are already in the national insurance um, uh, set up because it'll be, I've, I've paid 45 years of contributions um, uh, but there'll be, be people who've paid 20, 30 years. Is there a kind of plan to transition that, or how does that work? Um, I'll, I'll hand on to you guys. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, was, I was only limiting myself to the state pension just because 20 minutes to talk, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so yes, you do have private pensions and you've got public sector employment pensions, which are a different category altogether. Um, they're all in, in terms of budgeting. They're already sort of ring fenced within the Scottish government budget. So, in the event of independence, it, they, would, they would just carry on as normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, as both uh, me and George have said, you know, unless there's some sort of deal to the contrary, the the standard position is that if you've paid your 35 years net worth of national insurance upon independence, the UK government is. Uh, obliged to, to pay you your, your full state pension. If at the point of independence you've paid 20 years and then you pay a further 15 years worth of national insurance or, or the Scottish equivalent post independence, then that liability would be split. And then if you start paying the equivalent of national insurance completely after independence, then by the time you retire, the Scottish government would have the full liability on that. That's, that's the, the, the standard sort of maths of it. Uh, politics might get in the way, you might get debt and asset swaps along the way, but 
unless there's a deal to the contrary, that's that's what would happen. Yeah, so the next kind of years, like you say, you Only if the UK defaults on it. <laughs> if, if the UK, I mean, looking at all contingencies, if 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 an extremist, the UK government, and I don't think they would, because it, it would cause them such international repercussions legally, they wouldn't. But if, if they said they weren't paying the pension, um, then we would simply not pay our share of the UK national debt, which is running at 84 billion a year at the moment uh, in terms of interest payments, um, which they, so they'd be expecting us to pay in pro rata. Um, and it's going to go up. So actually, we'd make on that deal because we'd be giving them less than they were giving us. So we, the pensioners would still get their money. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not to take too much away from George, but if you go onto the Commonweal website, onto the library, there's a paper on debt and asset separation uh, called Claiming Scotland's Assets. It goes through a bunch of scenarios and how you would separate things like that. Okay, um, I'm, this lady in yellow hasn't asked a question, but I do make this um, the final question and leave your questions maybe this afternoon because we've We've only got an hour for lunch and people have got to leave and go out of the building to get a sandwich. So I don't want to encroach on the afternoon, but we'll make this the last question, if that's okay. It's not really a question, it's more of a statement. You just said something there just, you just, said something there just now about um, going onto the Commonweal um, site and seeing yep. Now, you said that to people in here, but people out there... Um, don't get this kind of information. And we've been saying for, you know, obviously a long time now, um, in Scotland there is very little media outlet for voices like ours. Um, and that's probably still going to be the case should another election come within the next X amount of years. So it's, it's really no question, but how on earth are we going to get the information, the factual information, any kind of information out there to people, you know, public, just the public, because last time it was um, only that I can speak for Musselburgh, but the Musselburgh, the Labour um, candidates had leaflets that they had on it that the people weren't going to get their pensions, mm -hmm. then people would come to our stall and just say, we had, excuse me, the We Blue Book, um, we were sort of saying, yes, you will get it, and here's, you know, if you just look there, it's giving you a, a telephone number or a contact. So that's, that might continue this time again, and it's just like a never-ending battle trying to get information to the general public. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the answer there, I'm sure Ian can expand on this, is 100,000 conversations. Uh, a conversation is worth a, worth 100 leaflets. Um, so, you know, I can give you a 30-page screed on macroeconomics, and even if you do want to read it and understand it, you can. You can absorb all that information, and then you go and talk to people. And that's how the information really gets out there. Okay, thank you. Can we please uh, like say thank you to all our speakers. It's been a tremendous morning, and we'll go on this afternoon. It starts at 1.30. The musicians will be here at 1.00. Uh, just say one more thank you to our speakers. Thank you very much. So I just, just, just missed that. Oh, should we add it up? For, uh, uh, <laughs>
I take it now or will I come and get it when it's so yeah, take take uh, this one. It does have a a mute switch on it, this one. So if it, um so when it's if there's you know, during the talks or whatever you can just have it. Ah oh, well that good then I don't have to yeah, watch what I'm saying. Yeah, and it does <laughs> it picks up a lot of noise and stuff as well. But just have to remember to put it on. shall be a short break in the transmission and we should be back with you.
Well, I think I'll just go for the bit. No, no. I've got a problem with some of this conflicts going on. 